Uh, my name is Masood Kolkar. I'm the University Librarian and Keeper of the Tin Collection at the University of Leeds and the Vice Chair of Research Libraries UK. I will be chairing today's roundtable session on charting new territory, mapping the international skills landscape for research libraries in the spirit of openness. It is a really exciting session, one that's really close to my heart, and I'm so glad we have an amazing set of panelists for this discussion. And I hope the audience will join us in that discussion as well. But before that, a little bit of context setting and housekeeping. So the first and foremost thing I would say is if you're joining this session uh, via feed loop, then can I encourage you that you can uh, either close feed loop or mute it and join this roundtable via Zoom. You can access Zoom by clicking on the gray box within feed loop, uh, which often states click here for additional live stream options. Joining directly through Zoom gives you direct access to this panel, to the discussion, but also enables all the other features that we need uh, for this session. Right, so setting the context for this session. So um, firstly, we've been talking about skills for a very long time, and we know how important it is to make sure that our staff have the right skills for accelerating uh, the, the direction that research libraries are going in. But we also know that the pandemic and the digital era and a huge range of other factors have really changed the role and remit of research libraries over the past few years. And that requires a different set of skills and competencies. And we need to enable that in our staff workforce now and start taking this more seriously than ever before. But this can also create different challenges. Individual institutions can often find it difficult to know where to start, how to develop it in a systemic fashion. And often we start thinking about this whole landscape in a collective fashion, which is one of the real benefits of working in such a collaborative profession like academic libraries and information uh, professionals. Um, it's also really important to take into account the international skills market while we're discussing the skills shortage and the needs that we have. And that's why I'm really pleased that we have a global um, set of panelists in this discussion, really talking to us about what's happening in their own local regions about skills as well. And it's not just about acquisition of staff, but it's also about retention. It's about also about management of those skills on an ongoing basis. And I'm really pleased to say that our UK has been doing a lot of work in this space, including joining the ARLPD Bank, creating a collaborative transatlantic skills exchange program with CLEARS, Data and Digital Scholarship Working Group, and through our fellowship schemes with both AHRC and the UK National Archives. But we want to broaden the conversation today. We want this conversation to be a really inclusive conversation, a really open and honest account of where we need to do more in terms of our skills um, enablement of within our staffing. So nature of today, this will be a highly interactive session. It will take the form of a virtual roundtable. Um, we will have six panelists throughout available in this discussion from across the research library community who will sh share their wisdom, their insights from both within the UK and in from North America. They will shortly introduce themselves as well. But we are also really hoping that you will join us in this conversation. There will always be space for two members of audience to join us and share their own thoughts, their own reflections, and their own ideas about what we need to do more. So please do feel free to share your institutional experiences, your personal experiences, and the collaborative opportunities around skills sharing within the research libraries landscape. This session is about conversation. It's not a broadcast session. So the level in which our panelists will talk will be quite minimal. And therefore we wanted to really generate an active debate on this topic. It won't include any formal presentations, but will include a series of free flowing conversations about skills development and the uh, knowledge sharing between international research libraries. The session will be structured around three key elements, the first of which is viewing the landscape. So what is the current skills landscape for academic and research libraries and how is this changing? Mapping the terrain, what are our experiences of navigating this landscape? And what are the opportunities and challenges that it provides to individuals, to institutions, and to communities of practice, including research libraries? And lastly, we will be charting our course, as in how can we work together? How can we work together as individuals, institutions, 
and communities to capitalize on our shared experiences to form collaborative approaches to skills. This is not any one single individual uh, responsibility. This is all of our responsibility. And it would be great if we can harness all the conversations today to reach some tangible conclusions which we can undertake within Research Libraries UK, but also across the broader library and information profession. Our panelists will explore each of these themes from their own perspective, but as I mentioned, really invite contributions from you uh, in this uh, landscape. Please, please come in and talk about what your experiences are. Um, and if you experience any issues via feed loop, please, as I mentioned, do join via Zoom. If you have a question, you can post this via the chat function in Zoom. And if you want to join us at the round table, please just raise your hand using the raise your hand button in Zoom. And that will allow us to bring you from the virtual audience into the live audience. And there might be a moment as you transition in that. If you're on Twitter, please use the hashtag uh, for the conference, which is hashtag RLUK2222. And at this time, I would absolutely love to invite my fellow panelists to to turn their cameras on, to join this conversation. And I will invite them to provide a one and a half minute introduction to themselves, their institution, and their work in relation to skills landscape. Uh, so I will go through the round table in the order in which people are appearing on my screen and ask Brian to introduce first, then Jason, then Fiona, then Kirsty, then Lee, then Eleonora. Well Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Keith, and I'm the Associate Dean for Administrative Services and Faculty Affairs at the University of Florida Libraries. And so uh, the uh, finance, budget, human resources, training and development uh, facilities, um, and those sorts of services centralized report through me. Uh, I also uh, provide leadership to the diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice uh, programs of the libraries our grants management program, uh, faculty development mentoring, professional development travel, and uh, our graduate student internships and our undergraduate fellowship programs. Uh, the Smathers Libraries are uh, the official name of the UF Libraries, and we employ about 400 uh, people, including 75 uh, library faculty members. Uh, but we also have a, a, you know additional uh, uh, folks that are uh, really uh, providing interesting things for us to think about in the world of skills. Um, UF is one of the most uh, diverse academic institutions. It's almost one, it's also one of the larger ones in the uh, United States with over 50,000 students. And uh, it's a research intensive um, uh, public uh, university. And uh, I'm also uh, one of the folks that came up with the idea and has been uh, leading uh, the ARL PD Bank, which will soon be uh, renamed the Research Libraries PD Bank in recognition of the fact that it extends far beyond ARL, including the RL UK, we're very happy to say. And so, uh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Jason? Good afternoon. I'm Jason. Clark from uh, Montana State University Library in uh, the Rocky Mountains of the United States. A um, little background about, the, so the institution I come from is a uh, mid-sized, about six, 60 full-time staff, uh, public university, land-grant university um, with a high research ranking, which is a little unusual for our, uh, just our local peers, peers. Uh, institutions, a little more research focused than uh, other folks in the region. Um, my interest and uh, particular, I suppose, um, what I can contribute today is I'm coming to this discussion as a teacher, workshop leader, and facilitator of the CLEAR DLF, that's Council of Library and Re Information Resources, Digital Library Federation Working Group on Dig Data and Digital Scholarship. Um, I've also been an active teacher um, for the DLF around um, data librarianship. Um, in particular, the, that working group has sparked uh, a number of ideas around networking, 
and skill sharing. And uh, I will drop a few links as I talk later around the um, RLUK and ClearDLF skills directory, which is a collection of folks who have opted in to talk about their skills and share, uh, share knowledge uh, internationally. As far as my day-to-day um, -day work, I'm really interested in data librarianship, data services. Um, the, my title is Head of Research Optimization, Analytics, and Data Services at Montana State University Library. Um, and I'm really interested in connecting data to stories and integrating library expertise and our services into um, forms of the research enterprise. So thanks. Really excited to be here. Thank you, Jason. And it goes without saying that's a really exciting job title. We are all a bit jealous now. <laughs> right, Fiona. Thank you, Masood. And Jason, that does make me feel a little bit puny by saying I'm an associate director of the library at the University of Sussex, which is a um, medium sized research university on the south coast of England. Um, my role uh, includes managing um, a team of around 50, altogether about 80 in our library. And um, I'm really, really interested in the idea of how we create a, um, a flexible, agile workforce, but also acknowledging that that workforce needs to evolve and keep up with the changes that are coming with a digital shift. So um, one of the pieces of work that I've been doing as part of RLUK with the Associate Director Network is looking at um, a strategy for our workforces of the future, which is feeding in a huge amount of the work that I'm doing with our own HR systems to think about how we recruit, how we diversify, how we are more inclusive in how we bring our workforces together. Thank you. That's great, Fiona. Thank you so much. And Kirsty, please. Hi, so I'm Kirsty Lingstadt. I'm Director of Library Archives and Learning Services at the University of York. Um, and we're a, I would say, mid-sized research intensive Russell Group University. And I suppose my interest comes from several areas, being involved as co-chair of both the Digital um, Scholarship Network for RLUK, but also for LIBA, looking at digital scholarship and digital collections. So I've had a long-standing interest in collections, but digital, and therefore also the kind of people side of how do we make digital happen? Um, and how do we embed digital within our workforce? What skills do people need in order to take advantage of some of these new technologies that are coming along? And some of the challenges that new technologies place on us and how we develop in order to respond to those. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Kirsty. Uh, over to you, Lee. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Lee Bonds. I'm the digital humanities librarian at The Ohio State University. Um, in that role, I consult with arts and humanities faculty and students on research and teaching. I teach digital humanities praxis and pedagogy, collaborate on projects, and coordinate the campus digital humanities network. Our library serves a rather large land grant to R1 campus. Um, this year, Ohio State has a total enrollment of just shy of 68,000 students, 17, a little over 17,000 of which are in the College of Arts and Sciences where the Arts and Humanities Division lies. Uh, for the last two years, I've served as the co-chair of the Association of Research Libraries Digital Scholarship Institute working with a team of instructors across you know, the United States to design curricula on a range of digital scholarship approaches and topics focused specifically on developing librarian skill sets. I'm currently collaborating on a project exploring my Ohio State colleagues' involvement in research partnerships to better understand their roles and contributions um, and specific skills they've either found useful or they found they need to develop further. I'm very interested in applying these experiences to collaboratively, collaboratively developing um, a DS competency framework and training curricula specifically for librarians to support their work as research partners. Excited to be here. That's lovely, Lee. Thank you so much. And Eleonora, please. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eleonora Gandolfi, and I'm the Head of Digital Scholarship and Innovation at the University of Southampton in the UK in the South Coast. Um, the University of Southampton is a mid-size um, research-intensive um, university, um, and I'm also the co-convener with Kirsty um, of the Research Library UK Digital Scholarship Network. Um, I've been, and I'm also part of the Research Library CK and HRC Arts um, Humanities Research Council Research Engagement Program Steering Groups. Um, um, I've also been a, re a, a recipient myself of the Research Library CK and um, the National Archives Fellowship. So I went through um, the process of applying and being successful there. Um, and I've just recently finished a PhD on the development of transferable digital skills. Um, through a lifelong approach and community engagement and how um, those um, skills um, and um, methodology can be embedded in the traditional education. That's wonderful. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. And I'm sure everyone will agree that this is going to be a really exciting and really enriching discussion today. Just the amazing vast experience that um, our, our panelists bring to this discussion is, is just brilliant. So as a quick reminder, this session is using the virtual dining table analogy. So we are going to do this in three parts. The first part is viewing the landscape, which is a bird's eye view of what's the current landscape. And we, we will touch on topics like the great resignation, the great restructure, how do we retain talent. Following on from that, we'll look at mapping the terrain, what is our current experience of navigating this landscape of skills, what opportunities and challenges does it present? And lastly, we are going to look at uh, charting our course. So what have we learned and how do we shape our future individually and collectively together on that note? And as a reminder, it, this is a really interactive conversational session. So audience is welcome to join at any point. If you have any question, please add that in the chat. If you want to come to the virtual dining table, there are two empty seats all the time. You're very welcome to join us at any point. Just raise your hand using the Zoom raise your hand function and join the virtual stage. So it's, it's a real pleasure to actually start this discussion by talking about that broad landscape, viewing the skills landscape. And I wonder if I can instigate the very first question on that and invite uh, Brian and Kirsty to start that uh, and then invite other panelists to join the discussion along with our audience members. And I'm wondering if we can start with how would you characterize the current skills landscape for research and, and for research and academic libraries in the UK and in North America. So if I ask, if I go to Brian first and then Kirsty in that order. Okay, well, um, I guess I would describe it as uh, exciting and challenging. Um, and uh, when, when I use the word it, I'm, I'm talking about skills and I'm really talking about uh, skills, knowledge, abilities, experience and background. Uh, so uh, I think what I'm seeing uh, is going to be similar to what everyone is, which is uh, emphasis on digital and data. Uh, we have positions like data management, bioinformationist, informationist. Uh, we recently had a uh, natural languages programming uh, position awarded to us by the university, a big focus for the university's artificial intelligence. And so, you know, the, the notion that these positions would have existed in, in our library, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, um, it, you know, it's just a radical change. And uh, so part of what we're seeing uh, in terms of backgrounds is we're seeing people um, pursuing alternative academic careers. Many of the folks who are filling those positions have PhDs, so they're bringing that experience. And uh, so that's uh, changing the skills landscape and the way libraries work just because of those backgrounds and they're complementing the traditional masters in library science, which has been uh, the currency uh, for, uh, for our positions for, for decades. Uh, we're also um, seeing uh, the need for skills uh, in what we in the United States call uh, library assessment and basically the idea of evidence-based decision-making uh, being incorporated at all levels within the libraries. Uh, everything that we do, uh, including what we would have traditionally called tech services, things like cataloging and acquisitions, those are really technology positions now, uh, in addition to those traditions. And so, for example, you see cataloging becoming metadata. Uh, that's the growth in that area for us. 
And uh, you see some of the cataloging functions transitioning from what we uh, would have had librarians doing to what staff are doing. Um, and so uh, we're also adding roles uh, in things just to make the enterprise work uh, and to expand our impact like exhibits, grants administration, programmers, social media, and they're bringing their own unique kind of professional norms too. So I think that's impacting the skills landscape. Um, also a big uh, thing for us, as I mentioned in my introduction is diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And our library personnel are um, expected to contribute uh, to a workplace culture with those things, but also to incorporate it into their work. Uh, and so that creates a need on our part to position people to be successful in doing that through training and professional development, but also we're the uh, systems that support skills in our measurement and understanding of skills, things like evaluations and selection processes have to catch up with that. And um, so, you know, for all of these, uh, part, part of the challenge is we cannot, um, we can't cover all the bases we need to and expect to have in-house expertise in all of these areas. Um, you know, we're focusing in some, we're creating positions in some, but our uh, personnel really um, need uh, to, to benefit from international, national, regional engagement where skills are shared, um, learning is shared and those sorts of things. And so that's uh, kind of on the outside of the library, but even within the library, it says we're bringing these positions in, um, you know, and we have a data management librarian who's fantastic. We also have 6,000 faculty. Um, and about that many graduate students. And so the idea of le leveraging those skills and, uh, and, and having it uh, work its way, that knowledge work its way through the library system is uh, kind of the exciting, but also challenging uh, thing that we're seeing. So, I, you know, I could talk on and on. Um, I, I'll try and resist doing that and I'll, I'll pause here. I'm up. Kirsty. Yes, I was going to say I'll pick up at that point and, and try and kind of um, add some sort of UK colour to um, where we are currently at. And I suppose one of the interesting things that you commented on was um, those Altac careers. And while we're seeing a similar trend in the UK, it's perhaps not as strong and hasn't made its way as strongly through to kind of roles and positions within libraries. But I think just like the US, we're seeing a really changing and quite challenging landscape of needing lots of different things coming in. So although we've still got our traditional library skills that are required, we're needing more skills, different ranges of skills, and they're therefore bringing different and new professions into skills. And I suppose I'm sort of part of that, having come from a slightly different background, um, moving through into the sort of library sphere of things. And again, I think the sector is much more aware that we need that vast range of different skills in order to be able to deliver what we need, especially, I think, COVID-19, the new kind of move towards working from home um, has meant a huge shift onto digital and digital skills. And I think we're all grappling with helping existing staff gain those kind of digital skills to really be able to cope. But also we're beginning to recruit differently because of that with a different eye to those digital skills that we need. And I think that's also brought with it that sort of changing role of the library and that sort of wider landscape and you touched on research and we've got, you know, research data and, and people's job titles now. The publications and research landscape is changing and again that needs us to work in different ways and have different skills. So therefore we are embracing having developers, programmers, that kind of metadata field has become much more technical. And in the future, as um, automated metadata creation moves on, we will need again a range of different skills to help support how that metadata becomes available and discoverable. But I think for it all, we still have a really strong human element that we need to provide and that sort of human contact, interpretation and touch point, that kind of connecting people to those collections and making them discoverable in a sort of human way that we can work with. But on the alternative side, we've also got another range of skills that we need to bring in round about sort of data science, but also converting our kind of huge content that we're working with into collections as data so it can be machine readable. So that becomes a partnership between humans and machines so that we can get more and gain more from those collections. And I think 
Brian, you touched on the sort of um, diversity and inclusion. I think with millennials kind of increasingly coming into the job market, we're also seeing that kind of wider shift towards what people want from work. We've changed what we want from our working environments, and that brings us to and um, means that we bring different attitudes to work and what we want out of work. Um, so again, we've seen that huge shift around about staff being much more active and activists within the workplace. Um, but I suppose it's also led to those huge challenges of people really rethinking what they want from the workplace. And so things like the great resignation, the sort of changing environment of different skills mean that we're increasingly competing in a market where staff have much more choice around about what they can do and what they want to pick and choose. And I suppose one of my other reflections um, based on conversations um, that happened recently was just around about the fact that as librarians, we've got a skill set that is really valuable to research data, data science, and those other kind of areas that we sometimes underplay but need to promote much more. And that's another sort of changing part of the sort of landscape. We are a much more valuable commodity to the wider world as it starts working increasingly with data. Um, because we actually understand metadata, how to make it discoverable. You know, you can have as many research data sets as you want, but if you can't find or work with those and reuse those, then they don't have as much value. So I think we're in a sort of really shifting context, but not just as our sector changing. I think lots of other sectors are changing and suddenly needing new skills. And perhaps we are the new developers in another environment. That's a absolutely wonderful start to this conversation, uh, full of imagination, but also full of opportunities and challenges. And I wonder at this time if I can invite uh, other panelists to come into this conversation and share their thoughts. Uh, does any of this resonate with you? Do you have slightly different viewpoint? So I was seeing nods from Jason and Eleonora. Do, do any of you want to come in? Um, I'll, I'll come in and say it's quite hard, Masood, to, um, to say so without actually saying what we're going to say later on in the session, because I think everything that both Brian and Kirsty have said resonates, um, you know, that's a view of the skills landscape, it certainly resonates in terms of how we map that landscape and the challenges that are there, so um, I'll say no more on it just now. <laughs> That's great, Fiona. Thank you for coming in. And while I'm going to give a chance for Jason and Eleonora to think a bit more, notice Susan has joined us. And Susan, do you have anything you would like to add to that, please? Yeah, I suppose I was interested as you were talking then, uh, both Brian and Kirsty, about what this means for roots into the profession and what it means to be a librarian. Because you talked about Yes, the skills of a librarian, the metadata, the cataloging, but much broader skills as well you picked upon, Brian, in terms of natural language programming and that kind of thing. So I wondered what your thoughts were about how we expand sort of those routes into librarianship or what it means to be a librarian. Yeah, I, I, I mean, what a profoundly interesting question. I mean, you really, um, that's a great one. I think, um, what I would say is, you know, the it's it's unknowable what librarianship is going to be like and how it's going to continue to change. I guess the fundamental part of it that we would kind of rely on are the professional principles, you know, that were developed over a long period of time, and in a field that experienced profound change. You know, um, our first. Uh, I was speaking with someone recently about the first branch library that did not have a card catalog and what a bold step that must have been, you know, for those folks in 1987 when it opened up. And so I think, you know, the underlying principles that are the foundations of a, you know, library science program um, and, you know, the development, not only of those foundations, but also the skill sets that Christy was talking about that they then get incorporated in, into work that we can't even think of or weren't thinking of five years. One of the things that I think is interesting is how, you know, how these different positions and these skills fit fit into a system that was based on branches and uh, technologies or, or tech services unit um, organizations and how we're, you know, trying to do that, how those services are discoverable, 
you know, um, you know, by our patrons and those sorts of things. And, you know, we have a science library that has um, about 20 librarians. And some of those are PhDs with chemistry. A lot of them are masters in library sciences. Some have, some have both uh, advanced degrees. And, you know, I don't know what our science library would be if it had, at what proportion it starts being a very different science library if that proportion, you know, got beyond 50%, but we haven't reached there yet. So I, I don't know if that's a, a it, I think that's responsive. I don't know if it's satisfactory. I'll let Christy do a better job of responding to your, to, to your prompt, Susan. I don't know about better job, but I suppose I would say um, as we, as Brian was just saying, it is those underlying principles are still necessary because actually all of this is about discovery of knowledge. And um, it's just that the discovery of knowledge and how we do it has changed. And um, we need some of the sort of key elements and foundational elements of what librarianship has always been. But then yes, we do need to evolve and kind of bring new approaches and techniques into that. And I suppose if I were looking at it today, I would also say, we're in a world that is ever changing and has experienced really fast change. So that kind of ability to change, which I think most librarians have um, because they've seen so much change um, and new technologies coming in in their lifetime and have continued. Yeah, and it's a learning profession. I think that's one of the other underlying principles. It's a profession that's keen to learn um, and has an inquiring mind. And I think actually those librarianship principles with that inquiring mind, but then also new techniques and technologies brought in. But what we train people in today will have changed in 10, 15 years time. So actually what we're training much more now is for sort of attitudes and aptitudes and approaches and that recognition that this will be a changing profession from now on and it will pick up in speed in its change. That's great. Um, Eleonora, I'll bring you in now and then I'll pick up a couple of questions from the chat for the panelists. Yeah, so it's just a, a quick reflection on everything that's been discussed and on the question that um, Susan asked, uh, because it, it's clear to me, I mean, it was clear before, it makes it even more clear now how um, interdisciplinary our profession is, has always been, but it's even more visible right now but bringing the expertise of people coming from a pathway um, that is different from a traditional uh, librarianship um, training, um, as for example, I did. And I definitely come with um, skills that are complementary and it's not that one is better than another one. It's just to reiterate how um, the libraries are becoming more central as a place where innovation is happening um, by bringing and collecting and collating everyone um, in one place, which could be physically or of course virtually right now has been seen in the last two years. Um, and it's just making it even more visible to the rest of our academic and student community as well, that we're not just a place a building with a lot of books, like a lot of <laughs> colleagues in the faculty sometimes refer us to, uh, but just a place where innovation and research is happening, where skills um, are developed constantly. Um, so I think it's just, uh, just even more exciting place where to work and be. Thank you, Eleonora. Uh, I noted, Jason, you, you had your hand up for a second. Do you want to add something in response to the question Susan asked, uh, and then I'll move on to some, some other questions? I was going to maybe start to address Kyle's question, but I don't want to jump, jump too far ahead. Uh, that's not a problem. I was wondering if you can pick Kyle and Stuart's question in the second part, which is about what do we need to do in terms of actions? Uh, and I wonder if you can pick Hope's question now, which is um, related to what Kirsty was saying, which is on the note of librarianship being a learning profession. And if you think about it holistically, do we really need to think differently about how we promote librarianship, how we advertise it, how we talk about it? Uh, and what do the panelists think about that? So Fiona and then Kirsty. Um, I, I really agree. I, it really resonated with me as well, Kirsty, when you were saying that, because I think as librarians, traditionally, we've not valorized our assets. We've not kind of uh, we've not shown off 
uh, what we are really good at um, and we've always seen ourselves as sort of supporting roles and uh, that's changing so much it's changing so much um, that I, I fear we could end up getting left behind by it and other people come into that sort of um, into the gap that's left but we are we do have this amazing skill set and we are a learning profession we learn ourselves but also I think um, you know we've got so much to teach uh, the other professions as they're keeping up with it as well so it resonates with me too And I think it is just that ability, I think because we work with knowledge and because nowadays in order to really unlock that knowledge, you need those digital skills. I think that's what puts us in a really unique position. And I think actually everyone around us is beginning to recognize that in order to work with this huge kind of body of knowledge that's out there, be it research data or whatever's on the web, that some of these librarian skills that are quite traditional, but so applicable in the modern day world are really, really valuable. Um, and I think if we can shout around about that more and more, that actually being a librarian is a kind of, you know, some of the skills we have a key in order to navigate the modern world um, and what an amazing profession we are, that that would, you know, start maybe change some people's perceptions. And I think, you know, with the news being very much around about, certainly in the UK, about public libraries closing, there being less resource and less funding, it's become a less attractive career path perhaps, but I do think it unlocks a lot of where we're going. I have a slightly different take on it, um, but that I completely agree with these, but I guess I have a different perspective to share. One of the things that I don't think we've talked about is how those principles of librarianship, um, you know, are, are share are, are uh, taught um, to um, people who, you know, come in with a PhD in chemistry or data science or something like that. And obviously part of it's on the job training, there's conferences, there's associations and those sorts of things, which are really important, um, you know, just participating in the culture. But I have long thought that um, the uh, master's in library science, uh, you know, those programs, um, you know, that if they could expand to have some sort of accelerated, shortened um, opportunity for someone who's, who finds themselves with their career in libraries uh, to complement um, their, uh, you know, whatever their advanced degree is or, or, you know, specialization without it having to be a two or three year investment and in tens of thousands of dollars and those sorts of things. So I think there is something for you know the folks that are that are do that are running the professional programs to help us um, as a field, um, you know, evolve. Ryan, that's a fantastic segue into the next question, which is more about uh, actually mapping the terrain. So, what opportunities exist for us as individuals, as communities, and as, as institutions, but also what challenges does it present? But before we delve into that and the questions that we'll pick up from the chat, uh, William has joined us. Very warm welcome, William. William, do you have any thoughts or questions or comments to add? Well, first of all, I'm going to join the team resonate that uh, this this all really resonates. And obviously, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Fiona. But I think I really just wanted to lob into the, the discussion, the other end of the spectrum. So to think about the roots into the profession, one of the challenges that I think we have in is the, the challenges around the sort of leadership and around what are some of the, the skills and the needs for the directors kind of in order to actually manage what becomes a much more interesting, a much more diverse uh, you know, range of a range of staff and a range of different skills, perhaps with different elements of you know, awareness of those those kind of principles. So kind of reflecting there, Brian, as you were saying, yeah, being able to look at how can we transition, you know, staff who have, for instance, chemistry degrees into, you know, some of the work that we want to do around research and support and librarianship, but without them doing, you know, some three years master's course or X, Y, and Z. So I really just wanted to throw that into the into the discussion pot. That's lovely, William, and also links with something that I think Ali's picked up in the chat and brands mentioned about what's on the job training and how do you release capacity for staff to also learn on the job. So that would be a really interesting theme to pick up. Uh, but I wonder if I can give a chance for Fiona to start 
the discussion on this and share her thoughts. And then I'll come to you, Jason, after that. Thank you, Masood. Um, actually, I was going to start by saying that reading through the uh, the questions and the, the chat and listening, it's made me think that there's probably more challenges at the moment than opportunities. Um, but I'm going to start with the opportunities. And I think the what I think is really exciting at the moment, particularly with the idea of um, this digital shift, is that we can navigate this landscape together. Um, we have the opportunity for collaboration through things like the, the PD Bank, through uh, conferences such as this, our networks to be able to learn from each other. And what's exciting is that we're not simply looking to um, our sector to do that, but we're looking to other countries, we're equally looking to other sectors as well. And I think there was mention made earlier about um, from Susan's question about how do we recruit, how do we bring people into this? And I think we have that really exciting way of um, making librarianship or libraries so much more than people assume they know them to be. And that's again about the valorization of it. And to do that though, that's where the challenge is. And I think in terms of sort of mapping that terrain, we really need to not just scope the skills we have, but the skills that we are teaching library students. Indeed, do we need to look at library courses in the same way? Which should we be kind of diversifying much more in terms of how we recruit and looking to different courses and different sectors to, to bring people in to our workforce to fill some of those gaps? Um, we certainly need to also, I keep using the word valorize today, but to valorize our the skills that we do have. So again, reflecting on what Kirsty was saying earlier about the expertise that we have in librarianship, being able to really push that in the direction that can take advantage of the digital shift. And yes, that might mean some upskilling, that might mean a lot of upskilling, and we do need to navigate, and again, this is something that appeared in the chat earlier, how we give people time to do that, um, it, as well as doing the day-to-day -day job. I think the way that we do that is by saying this is your day to day job um, and we incorporate that training in everything we do, but also incorporate it in our strategy, because when it becomes our strategy, we will just build it in. Um, and just because I know my three minutes are almost up, I'm going to refer to something that, that um, Stuart Dempster mentioned in the chat as well, which I don't have an answer for, but we're seeing all over the place. And that's in terms of recruitment, much as we want to recruit inclusively and um, equally and recruit skills, it's very hard sometimes to do that in a landscape where our resources are so limited and we're seeing more and more, particularly around digital skills, that salaries um, aren't necessarily matching what people's expectations are when we're trying to recruit as well. So I'm going to leave it there. I don't want to leave it on a down, but I'm going to have to, I think. <laughs> I'll do the positives after. That's brilliant, Fiona, and great, great introduction and start to this discussion. And thank you for picking up a question as well. That's wonderful. Uh, Jason, if, if I can come to you and invite you to share your thoughts. Sure, thanks. Um, I dropped a, an, one of the ideas, and I think you heard it pretty clearly from Brian and Kirsty, uh, um, related to, I just want to re remake this point, uh, computer science, um, even before the pandemic, that digital shift, um, the expectation that computer science might be part of librarianship, um, that was already, that, that movement had started. Um, and, and you can look into places like industry um, where you have the expectation uh, that you might be a journalist and a writer, but you also have to be conversant with how to do web scraping or text mining or data visualization. And it's the same kind of holistic pressure that's happening, I think, within, within our profession. Um, so I, I'm just kind of bringing us back to what 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 does that pressure do, or what are what, what are we seeing in terms of what's happening as we respond to that? Maybe it's not pressure, expectation. I'll call it an expectation. Um, and three things that kind of come to mind as I was looking around and kind of understanding what our various organizations are presenting as workshop or training opportunities, um, and and the things that strike me are around. This, the first idea of um, there's, there is a, a kind of movement to create more, more networking, more internal ways of sharing and building this knowledge together. So there are smaller kind of 
in-house opportunities where um, I think Helen Williams is on the call. She's at London School of Economics, but we had a conversation about a, a, a kind of think tanky data shaping community or data shaping practitioners kind of interest group that she built within the London School of Economics library where they were able to sort of talk about what's happening in data, what are some expectations, where would we look? So there's this kind of internal network that's happening in libraries. That's one of the opportunities, one of the responses. Um, even further out, you have obviously the training, the training opportunities that we're seeing, um, professional development opportunities, and even beyond that, in the internal examples, you've got international collaborations like, I'm going to drop something in the, uh, I mentioned in my intro, um, the UK DLF, and there are a couple of links right there. Um, this idea that we have, we have a set of skills between our international organizations. Um, I think that's another one of these responses and opportunities. Um, and, and this is a means to sort of elect into and share what you have knowledge about to, to a community and kind of connect. And the reason I'm able to say anything about Helen, uh, Helen and Williams and her, her work at, at London School of Economics is because I connected, there she is, I connected with her during the, uh, during one of our events, our RLU UK DLF event. So, um, and then I, I want to, I, one other, as I was thinking through this, the other thing I think I'm seeing a lot more of, especially in our, my environment is how do you supplement expertise and even how do you embed or find ways to get librarians within uh, trained on research funding and or um, embedded within research grants. Um, so supplementing expertise, you heard um, Brian talk about Alt AC careers and postdoctoral candidates and PhD uh, PhDs with specialties that enhance our work. Certainly, that's something that's something that's been a response and an opportunity. Um, but even further, there are ways that I, I'm seeing um, people like our um, <clears throat> we have a data curation librarian here who's actually embedded 80% time on a research grant. Um, one of the primary research grants on campus. Um, I want to flip to, that doesn't really scale. Uh, you know, when you, you heard Brian talk about 6,000 faculty members, but it does create a different view of the profession. When Venice is in these environments and she's talking metadata and data management and she's doing some data mining, um, that value of librarianship is expressed in a, a very strong and, and, and it's able, able to be understood by researchers. Um, I, the last thing I'll leave, I'm going to drop one more idea, and actually it's called idea. Um, hold on. But you'll see a, a number of our um, granting agencies are starting to fund professional development. Um, and what's interesting about this professional development is this was um, particularly interested in the professionals that are, that are working um, and get in, not able to go back to school or not able to really um, don't have time, they've already established themselves in their careers, but also um, looking for representation, so DEI, um, making sure that um, the right people are going to get training and working across public, academic, and special libraries. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Lots of ways to respond to this, and I think this is, this is kind of the landscape of what we're seeing. That is brilliant. And actually, there are so many hidden gems in there, which allow us to focus on our next discussion about where do we chart our future together, which we'll come to in a bit. Uh, but a few things I picked up from, from your conversation and the chat, I think there's a real interesting dynamic emerging here about what's the profile and value of the library and how we advertise it, what language do you use, what terminologies do we use so that we can shift away from that service provider role, particularly here in the UK, to a partnership role with the academic faculties. There's a really interesting dynamic on pipelines and actually what, what our culture looks like when we are diverse pipelines. And actually, is this just library schools or is it about other pipelines, uh, especially with the digital skills needs that we're talking about? Um, and then there's a really interesting point, Jason, you made about uh, research grants and actually the culture. And it links back to that profile side of things as well. If, if the libraries are not considered as partners, we are not considered being a co-investigator or PI in a research grant either. So we don't get the benefit in the same way. So there's a really interesting dynamic that's emerging there. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. 
Um, I noticed Beth's here. Beth, lovely to see you again. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts and comments? Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I thought I would because LSE has been mentioned a couple of times. Um, I'm actually, uh, obviously I have a role which is uh, Associate Director for Digital Scholarship and Innovation, but also I'm Chair of our Training and Development Working Group in the Library. So I've been doing that for a couple of years since from COVID. So looking right through uh, the last two years, and we started by um, asking staff what skills they wanted to develop, what um, gaps they thought they might have. So we collected all this together and then we tried to match staff who had those skills to see, you know, well, can we match those up? Are there areas where um, we actually don't have this expertise at all? And so how can we develop it? Um, and one of those ideas out of that came, we realized there was a big gap around um, data manipulation. We're finding, you know, better ways of working. How can we use technology to uh, help with our processes, make things easier to free up extra time to do these new services, these new skills as well. Um, and this is where my colleagues, I think Helen and Fabi have been mentioned, set up this Data Shapers Community of Practice, which I think has about 14 members across the library now, where they talk about um, you know, problems that they have and how can we fix it? And people are developing different skills, like one staff member has done Python training and then shares their skills. And where we have a big gap, perceived gap, we, um, we've paid for uh, an external trainer to come in. But obviously what we're thinking is this is probably replicated <laughs> across you know, international situations as well. So how can we scale this up? And we know that the International Skills Exchange that we've mentioned has been very beneficial in making connections um, on an individual level, but also on an institutional level. But I would be interested in how can we sort of set up this opportunities at a, sort of a larger scale? <clears throat> and also how we approach it here is we do give staff time to develop these skills. And I know that's not always possible. So we try and do it in short bursts as well um, and informally. So there's a lot, we approach it in several different ways. So I suppose that's my question really, maybe that comes under the third part, but how do we scale this up? And um, if we are in a position where we are struggling to recruit, how not either because of resourcing, we don't have new posts, um, or if we do, we're not necessarily being able to attract the people that we need. How do we approach that as well internally? I think that's my question, or my observations. Thank you. That's a very astute observation, Beth. And I wonder if I can link a few things together and let Yvonne come in and, and share her thoughts as well. Uh, but a couple of things that I'm picking up from the chat and linking it with Beth. So firstly, um, the question about specialized skills. And if you, firstly, it's very difficult to bring them in, but if you bring them in, how do you ensure that they are not siloed within the library and that they are basically transferred between and uh, shared amongst the staffing as well? Then the question that um, Ali asked and that's linked with under, under resourced staffing models and what approaches we can take in terms of short bursts training, but how do we sustain that in, in that kind of environment? And I wonder, Yvonne, if you want to come in and add to that, and then we can bring it back to the panelists for their views on that. Yes, thank you, Masood. Um, I just wanted to come in um, really to uh, take a slightly different um, perspective on the uh, on, on the views of things. A lot of what we've spoken about this afternoon has very much been focused on what can we do within our individual institutions? What can we do when we're kind of recruiting people into our place of work or working with um, people being trained um, uh, to kind of join the profession and so forth? I think we also need to, um, uh, as Beth was saying, that there are various communities of practice 
practice um, and there are various communities around particular uh, areas um, of librarianship that we can take advantage of um, in terms of this kind of peer led learning um, and, and, and training and so forth. Um, it's always been one of the areas um, that uh, I've been lucky enough to be involved with, uh, certainly around the work with the repository um, community and with uh, the UK Council for um, uh, for Open Research and Repositories. It's it's an area where there is a lot of kind of peer learning, which comes out of necessity um, from be people being kind of, you know, it, it, having fewer colleagues within an institution to talk to. You find your communities um, across sectors. Um, uh, again, and, and also we have the various um, communities such as the Mercy and Collaboration the um, and the various other Sconnell um, communities where we can build learning um, and uh, kind of build peer learning across uh, across institutions rather than just within one. That's a really good point, Yvonne. And just for um, knowledge of others who are outside of the UK, Mercy and Collaboration is a regional collaboration and there are multiple collaborations of that nature here in the UK. And what it reminded me of on straight off is we really encourage the same kind of collaboration, same kind of uh, peer assisted learning for our students, because we know that the trainer didactic model simply cannot work even with active learning that can't work. So peer assisted learning has a really important place there. So why are we not thinking more of that for ourselves? So thank you for sharing your thoughts and your ideas. And Lee, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, so in addition to learning within the organization, I also wanted to kind of point to learning outside of the organization. We developed a program here at Ohio State where faculty members, you know, um, librarians in both subject librarians, area studies librarians and special collections librarians were given the opportunity to attend workshops um, mostly digital humanities workshops that were offered in the summer. So they're usually a week long workshop, whether they're at the Digital Humanities um, Summer Institute at the University of Victoria or at UPenn's Dream Lab. We had librarians go and attend workshops on image analysis, on you know, a broad overview of how digital humanities approaches are being applied to Japanese studies. We had um, others that went to specialized workshops on you know, um, digital humanities and Slavic studies. So these workshops gave those faculty, those individuals a kind of an understanding of a digital scholarship approach or approaches within their disciplines that they were working. So when they come back, they not only have built a network with other researchers that they've attended these workshops with, but they are also better positioned to collaborate with the researchers in their departments on campus. And so that level of engagement, I think is really important to foster. Sometimes bringing you know, people in to do these workshops doesn't really um, meet everyone's needs. You know, you can bring in someone to do text encoding, you know, a text encoding workshop, but that's not necessarily going to, you know, um, that's not necessarily what maybe, you know, someone who's working in the arts, you know, is, is going to need. So it's trying to determine where is the, what is the best approach to take to meet librarians where they are and to, you um, kind of foster their learning alongside others within their disciplinary areas. Thank you very much. So we have a couple more minutes on the topic of mapping the terrain and I'm wondering whether any other panelists would like to come in or an audience member wants to join in and share their thoughts. Kirsty. I mean, I think 
that sort of bringing in that digital scholarship perspective and getting people to go out and experience what different elements look like and kind of undertake training in other disciplines, I think is a really important element that we need to be thinking about much more. And again, looking at, at data science, that was something that um, Edinburgh had looked at and, you know, getting librarians trained up in data science to sort of see how do these disciplines work and operate, where are the commonalities, what elements can we bring back? But what can we also sort of take back out again? And I think that it's that collaborative looking outward um, as we sort of started this morning. It's about, you know, sharing and making that knowledge porous and going out, which is an important part. And for that, we need to embrace outward knowledge to bring in and vice versa as well. So just really echoing the last speaker a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Eleonora? I think Fiona had a hands up before me. <laughs> I, I was just going to pick up on uh, Hope's uh, last question in the chat, but you go, Eleanor, if we've got time, I will do. Uh, it was just to add another reflection. A lot of the times the training is not always a training to become the super expert that would do the super deep research. The training um, is just recognising that not everyone will need the same level of training. And sometimes it's just to have an understanding of how students and academic staff or visitors community in any case access or what they would need so that we can make work in the agile way as Fiona mentioned before in terms of responding of what our users really need from us it's just to trying to understand to you what language are we talking about are we referring to the same um uh, information are we talking about the same things and, and and again sometimes it's just explaining to our colleagues that we don't want them to become the expert in you know data mining or app creation they just need to be able to understand what the other member staff um, talks about when um, and it's, it's just about the communication and improve the communication and just have the shared language uh, which sometimes I think is not always clear um, when we're talking about training uh, and it's that level of being inspired by colleagues um, have a general understanding uh, versus you're going to be doing this for the next month. That's a really good point, Anna, because um, speaking the library language, I think uh, Lazarus was talking about this earlier, doesn't always help in that way, just recognizing what the needs are of the end user and how can we support them in the most appropriate fashion is, is quite critical. Uh, Brian, and then Fiona, I'll, I'll love for you to come in briefly as well. So Brian, if you want to go first. Yeah, the, the only thing that I would add is beyond uh, the training element is the capacity of uh, librarians, library faculty, library personnel in general uh, to engage in, um, in research and uh, self-directed research with the expectation that that actually take place. Um, that's part of the system. Uh, that we have at the University of Florida um, because our folks are uh, by and large tenure track faculty. Um, I wouldn't impose that on any other institution, but part of the benefit of that is the expectation for people to produce um, scholarship. And, you know, the byproduct of that is, um, I mean, it really incentivizes uh, learning. And we see people, you know, who are using um, social network analysis and their work and those sorts of things. And, uh, it, and it's a byproduct of that expectation and it's self-direction. What comes with it, which kind of gets to one of the questions about capacity is, you know, our folks have a minimum of a 10% release time. And, um, you know, that is a reduction in the amount of day job contribution and effort. But the notion is that there's long-term benefits from that. Thank you, Brian. And actually, before coming to Fiona, if I may add my own thought, I think we are really bad at that, if I'm speaking on my own behalf as well. We are really bad at actually generating appropriate workload capacity uh, monitoring because we say, oh, go and spend 10% of your time on something, but we have still the same levels of expectations from everyone. We still want all the projects to be done on timelines, et cetera. So I'll be the first to put my hand up and say, I think there's a long way for us to go in terms of recognizing what that means and actually releasing that capacity appropriately. Uh, Fiona, um, you've been waiting patiently for some time. Do you want to come in now? 
Sure. It's, it's, it's um, as I'm reading down the wonderful things that are coming through in the chat, and there are more and more things are coming out that I, I would like to comment on. But I just want to pick up on something that um, I think Ellie and Hope have picked up on, which was about um, understaffing limited staff capacity for CPD and for development and what have you. And I think this is really important because as, as our process has become more automated, increasingly we are going to need um, staff who have different skill sets and I think often that falls to our staff, uh, uh, our more junior staff, who don't necessarily have the time or the same element of freedom to be able to go and, and do that training. And it's something I don't have an answer for but I would really like to maybe spend some time looking at and I wonder if that's something that within RL UK, we might be able to do possibly within the ADN to just sort of share ways that we can enhance learning opportunities. I'm really interested in that peer assisted learning, for example, um, and, and just as a, as a network, be able to try and develop something that will share that load across. Um, and if other people are interested in that, then maybe, you know, get in contact with me and we may try and set something up. There's an offer. <laughs> What a wonderful segue to our third part of the discussion, which is about charting our course and what opportunities might exist uh, at an individual, institutional, collaborative and community level to, to navigate this landscape and for our collective benefit. So I am now going to invite uh, Lee and Eleonora to share their thoughts on this topic first and then open it up for wider comments and discussion. Eleanor, if you want to go first, I'll let you. I'll go. <laughs> so much of what I had planned to say has already been said. Um, so I'm going to briefly go through my notes that I have here to see. Um, I, I will say that, you know, I'm going to reiterate a lot of things, but it, it seems like that this, I can't say this enough about this. Um, the new focus of librarians as research partners rather than just service providers. That's a that's an incredible cultural shift, I think, um, and bringing with it incredible opportunities to engage more deeply into the research that is occurring on campuses. And um, in my um, just to give you some sense of where I'm coming from, I'm one of those you know alternate academics who came, you know, came into libraries. My background is in um, English literature. Um, so it was an easy transition into libraries uh, in, that, in that regard. And what I've noticed is that often, you know, I, I feel that, and this is just my observation, that librarians, curators, and archivists, because they have seen themselves as service providers, they don't really have um, a strong sense of how unique and invaluable their skill sets and knowledge bases are. Um, they bring a lot of experience to research partnerships, particularly you know, in areas around information literacy, organization, retrieval, access to digitization, metadata, content management, project management, scholarly sharing. Christy outlined some of these earlier, but all of these skill sets are integral to digital humanities projects. And so those roles um, are, are often the gaps that faculty you know, um, don't have as well. You know, they don't have the same skill sets that the librarians bring to these projects. So they're, they're quite complementary. Um, I'll add that there are you know, newer roles in libraries that, you know, like Brian mentioned earlier, my own you know, role in digital humanities, Jason's in data, these expand the, the library skill sets and, and knowledge bases even further. And they provide additional opportunities for the library's community to be involved in research partnerships. I do, you know, I partner a great deal with my colleagues who are subject librarians in the arts and humanities. And our, you know, we complement each other in um, these research partnerships that, we're, that we've formed um, working on faculty projects. Um, I'll say that, you know, this digital shift has added, you know, brings incredible opportunities to apply these skills in new ways and to develop complementary skills. There, you know, have been several reports, you know, released, I'd say in the, in the past five years, and I won't go through them all, 
for the lack of time, but I will put links in the chat momentarily. Um, but what they all emphasize is the need for research libraries to develop internal talent and that relying on new entrants into the profession, you know, just is not going to suffice. Um, particularly when these skills and competencies are in such demand as everyone has already said. Um, the specific skill sets or gaps um, have been explored by you know, both ARL and RLUK, and both have charted diversification of DS activities, the changing role of research libraries from service to active partnership, and the increasing variety of digital skills and competencies required um, to enable this, this transition. Um, one last remark I'll make, which also reiterates a lot of what um, has already been said, is that this work, meaning you know, developing, uh, developing competencies for librarians and developing a training you know, curricula for librarians and programs around this, it, can't, it cannot um, rely on volunteer labor. And without the library's community's support. So because this work um, will be transformational, transformational, we really need to leverage funding agencies like the AHRC, the NH, the NEH, and the IMLS to develop this kind of program fully. Um, we also have to have buy-in and commitment from libraries leadership members um, in RLUK, ARL, and CLEAR not only to prioritize and implement it, which touches on what some of, you know, else of what Fiona has already said, but to advocate for the well-deserved recognition of librarians as researchers and research partners on their campuses and to give our colleagues time to learn, to practice and to partner in lieu of, rather than in addition to, you know, less impactful work that they have already, you know, that they've been assigned. And um, yeah, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Eleanor. Thank you so much. I find it really difficult to come at the end of this <laughs> quite extensive um, discussion. As Lee, uh, I thought I've planned everything out and most of the things have been covered in the discussion before. And after, Lee, after your, um, uh, your chat, um, I have even less things to say because you're covering all the points I put out there. Um, what I think it, it, I, I can add to the conversation is, is really the recognition on how, what is the contribution that we actually make to the research and educational environment. Um, and, and just to remember this and invite colleagues to remember how, what is our contribution, not only as a service provider, but as a partner, because that is the, I think the key that unlocks the push to claim back the seats at the table um, as a partner and not as a service provider, to just reminding people where the skills um, are sitting. Um, and that we do have skills that maybe most of our colleagues and the faculties might not actually are aware of because we might have not promoted them uh, quite as extensively as we could. So a lot of the times it's just, uh, as Lee mentioned, it's just those skills are ready in most of the times so are just already um, within our libraries and our um, colleagues. Um, there is also, just from my personal experience, is just to remember that not all events or way of working actually are suitable for all different institutions. Um, because of course we might have slightly different priorities, slightly different expertise, and it's just a bit away on some of the comments, picking up some of the comments about the experimenting and piloting. Um, and just remember there is no failure, it's just a might not work at this point in time in our own institution for a number of reasons, which is could be time commitment to the staff that have the skills that might not be at the time uh, available. It could be a lack of infrastructure support um, and, uh, and having at that point a conversation with the directors of the library, the associate directors or colleagues to make sure that those things are in place um, to, for example, for example, free up 
time to improve the workflow to then, as again, Fiona and Christy were saying before, in terms of um, having a little bit of time and space and some of the comments to then focus on, for example, search project, and then recognizing that each of us has a different career path. And, and the wonderful library world is wonderful also because we have all these um, skills and expertise that are coming together. There is a this sort of community and um, um, we're not, there is no, there is an overlap but in a sort of um, sharing skills. Um, the other things is just to remember there are a lot of opportunities out there as many of um, the other panelists have remember in terms of training schemes that are more formal or more informal. Um, and as a line manager, if it doesn't matter how big is your team, it's just to remember to free up some of the time or how do you actually embed um, those experiences and opportunities? How do you make the most of your link and network um, to make sure that people then <laughs> the rest of the team um, or in the rest of the library community will actually have um, some of the same opportunities. Um, I just bring an example. So in terms of um, some of the results of my um, fellowship with the National Archives was just to, um, I had a knowledge of another scheme. There was an informal scheme that was run at that point in time. So I suggest someone in my team to then apply. And it's this informal conversation that kind of create a network to support um, innovation, but also this informal um, upskilling um, of our workforce. And I think I close out there. And, and the other thing is so just remember that there are a lot of expertise, if it's not in the library, in other libraries, but also within the academic community. So let's not remember that a lot of the times just sending an email to colleagues and said, would you mind uh, maybe sharing something with us? Uh, would you mind just coming in and maybe talk to someone 15 minutes, just how do you use this software, for example? for network analysis or can you help us? So that not only we are seen as a partner in the research um, arena, but it's also we are driving the research agenda um, for the faculty. And that I think my experience have helped shift in those conversation and unlock those conversation. That's really enriching, Eleanor. And uh, this is amazing considering you were going last and you've had such amazing insights. So fantastic, thank you so much. Kirsty, do you want to come in now? Oh, I managed to unmute myself. <laughs> I was just also thinking, a lot, although we're sort of struggling to bring people into the profession, we also have to remember that we're a very welcoming community. Libraries are really interesting places to work and that we really benefit from diverse professions joining us and being part of our library services to help kind of deliver everything that we need to deliver um, to our wider communities. And that, that keeping that openness of mind as well and allowing that kind of sort of porous nature to continue is a really important part and a really important part of us learning and maybe gaining some of those skills that we don't always need. I've learned a lot from the developers that I've worked with and other professions that I've then been able to apply and sort of bring on. So I think that sort of natural way of, of bringing in new skills um, and again, ensuring that there's, I think in the chat, there's been a number of different kind of community groups sharing information in the organization or the wider institution. And we just need to also bear in mind that there's really important tools that we have available to us. Thank you, Kirsty. So there's a huge amount of amazing um, chat going on at the moment, and there's a lot I can pick up on. But um, one thing I think it would be unfair of me if I don't mention the RUKHRC research fellowships that we've just introduced. The idea of it is to actually generate capacity for our staff to be to develop their confidence and their capability in doing independent research and developing their skills in that process and their fellows uh, skills in the process as well. And that comes at the expense of 20% cost to the library. So I think that's a clear declaration that uh, there is investment, but we need to do more of that and we need to do more across the library rather than just in certain parts of it. The uh, One of the questions, if I may be selfish and pick Alan's question from the chat, because I think that's really relevant, which is, uh, what's the role of the international in all this discussion of change? So, Lee, you were talking about uh, IMLS doing certain things on this in terms of grants. We know HRC here. 
we know that in the past there have been typical collaborations between the two. Can you, can the panelists think of more ways in which we can really harness the international power here? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start by talking about the um, ARL PD Bank, soon to be Research Libraries PD Bank, which was, you know, uh, the idea of it was built for the Association <clears throat> of Research Libraries and then it's expanded, you know, because the system itself can support that capacity. And um, so, I'm, you know, I, I think part of it is the, um, you know, just perceiving beyond the local use case of the systems that we're creating that are multi-institutional and thinking about ways in which they can expand beyond that. Um, I think the person's question, you know, um, also, you know, makes us think about the skill sets people need in order to be engaged in more international collaborations. And there's probably people who've thought more um, deeply and, and could give a better answer on that. But it made me think about um, the skill sets that we need to focus on in uh, leveraging the capacity of research libraries and the systems that we have to support um, communities that are closer to home and doing those in ways, you know, we're all focused on decolonizing, but I think that there's more proactive um, activities where, um, you know, the, the communities or the states or territories or provinces where we are would benefit from uh, the systems that and, and the skill sets that the folks who work with us have. And, you know, I think uh, digital um, infrastructure really lends itself to that sort of scale too, so. Thank you, Brian. Um, Eleanor? Yeah, it was just to add to what Brian was saying is, of course, we are now transitioning in a sort of the new normal going back to work and into more physical um, and, and it's just to make sure that um, we don't lose everything we gain in terms of opportunity within the digital that opened, for example, some of the work that Research Libraries UK has done around the um, uh, international and uh, skills as, as well. And the work that's been done within the Digital Library Federations um, uh, work there um, and it's just to make sure that the fact that how, how can we match without duplicating um, this um, hybrid and the online versus the physical and I think we're just trying to navigate how do we make sure that we're not losing both of them because there is so much we can learn by being on an international panel just having a chat in a more relaxing formal um, environment and and but everyone who has attended some of the work, that, um, some of the transatlantic skills exchange uh, events, um, colleagues have definitely benefited even from just uh, the two minutes quick um, chat with someone that you never met from someone else. Just, just to realize we're all in the same boat. We're all um, tackling the same challenges and it's just to share perspectives within the same topic. And it's it just to make sure that we're not losing everything we kind of gain with the digital shift um. that that is a really really good way to close our dessert part of the dining uh, uh, table and actually think about the the benefits that we've just received i mean I, I i can't speak on behalf of everyone else but just being here listening to all of you not I, my diary is completely full now because i've been taking so many notes but also the extremely rich chat that sh people sharing different views and uh, inspiring in many ways is, is absolutely fantastic. And we couldn't have really done that at this scale without the digital capability and infrastructure. So it's, it's fantastic. I wonder if I can um, ask the audience whether anyone would like to come in for a final conversation or share any final thoughts or questions. And I will also then leave you with a couple of probably not necessarily provocative, but uh, more holistic conversations about what we can do next. Uh, and the first thing I was thinking about was, um, we've talked about skills very much in a very technical specialist capacity, but there are far more 
ranging skills in terms of how we communicate, how we position libraries, how we uh, scale the kind of effort we are doing. And uh, there's a little bit of thought process behind, it's not always about trainings, but it's also about having a growth mindset and how do we develop a culture where that kind of growth mindset is also included. So it's not just someone is giving you permission to do something versus this is important and this is why we need to do it and this is important for the vision. So that kind of uh, multi-level skill and growth mindset across the board, I think that would be an interesting one. Another thought that was running through my mind was COVID-19. And I don't know how people are feeling about it, but my reflection is that people are really tired because they've been firefighting for a long time and they've been working hard and actually coming out of that mode to be able to say, actually, it's okay to relax a bit is quite difficult. While it's very difficult for us to say, actually, we've been working at that capacity for quite some time, but that wasn't normal. And actually redefining that normal back to what normal looks like is also a, a psychological shift, not just a physical shift. And there's an interesting dynamic on that about how do we revert back from that constant acceleration mode into something that's more stabilized? And how do we bring staff in that journey with us so they can release or we can all collectively release that capacity for learning and uh, development? And then the third thing I was thinking about was, uh, what are we doing basically on a day-to-day -day role, job basis? Because one of the most enjoyable things about your job is that you're learning through it. And actually, are we really analyzing that we are doing a lot of repetitive things or are we just growing because we are trying to match scale? And actually, there might be better ways to match that scale or not do it. So I think those are some of the really difficult questions that we need to ask about, can we do this at scale? Is it through staffing or is it through completely specialized skills on machine learning or artificial intelligence or something else? So I think there's some really interesting dynamics on what does what does that mean for our workforce generally and what kind of mix of workforce we might have in the future